Today we want to continue in our service, uh, our study of the parables of our Lord. And I've been calling them the stories, because they are stories. But the story is not the story, it's what it illustrates. He didn't tell them just to be entertaining, he told them to make a point. I'm going to ask you a question. If you're a little bit like me, <clears throat> you've had a prayer request that some, at some point you thought was really important. After praying for a while, it looked like the answer wasn't coming, but you gave up. Anybody like that? I'm the only one? Oh, there's a handful of people. Yeah, yeah, I, I just I tend to give up. And, you know, over 20 years ago, I was praying a spe specific prayer. And uh, I would pass by the church here, and I would pull in the parking lot, and I made the prayer request. Lord, make me the pastor of this church. I want to serve you here at this church. Because I knew you were without a pastor. And so for a short while there, I would swing by and pray. And guess what? You didn't call me as pastor. And, uh, and so not till 20 years later. 20 years later. But, but, so I gave up. I gave up on that prayer. Because you called somebody else. How short-sighted was I? Right? Because 20 years later, you did call me as your pastor. Isn't that amazing? He heard my prayer. That's, that's kind of the basis of my message today, the story that Jesus is telling. He's going to tell us two stories, two parables that are driving home a point he wants to drive home about prayer, about prayer. It says, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. I like that. Say, just say that. Always pray and not give up. Oh, man, we're, we're Americans. We want everything. We want it right now. You know, instant coffee, instant, I mean, instant everything, isn't it? And, and don't you stand in front of a microwave, which shortens the whole process of cooking something, and saying, why is it taking so long, all right? We are so impatient. And when it comes to our prayer lives, it's the same thing. God, we want you to do this, and we want you to do it now. Isn't that pretty much the way it is? I think it's the way it is. At least it is with me too often. This, I want to talk about the story that Jesus told about the widow who wouldn't give up. She wouldn't give up. Her problem was she had an unjust judge. That's what Jesus dubs him, the unjust judge in the story when he summarizes it all up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. I don't know how it is that people rise to power that have no moral values. But this man did. He's a judge. He has no moral values. Notice what it says. He is the opposite of what we are trying to become at Bethany. At Bethany, we want to become a Jesus-built church with people who have Jesus-built lives. Where the second commandment, the second step of, of our platform is, uh, the first one is the great confession, then the great commandment. And in the great commandment, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Two parts, love God, love your neighbor. This man did neither. And he's the judge. That's the whole point. When you leave these walls of this church, you're going to encounter people who do not share our same Christian values. And it's not just, uh, it's not just your neighbors. You can be, become before a judge this widow woman is, got her case before a judge who doesn't fear God and he really doesn't care about the people. That's a sad situation to be. But she is persistent. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with her plea. She was persistent. She kept coming over and over. Jesus setting up the scenario. She didn't give up. She went with her request over and over. And in the ancient world, the judge would be probably sitting at the gate of the city. Uh, and at the gate of the city there, he would hear the cases. Every day she was in line to have her case heard. I mean, she is persistent as can be. Now, her request is very simple. Grant me justice. She's not saying, Lord, she's not saying, judge, show me some favoritism. Uh, she's not saying, uh, fix my ticket. She's saying, I just want what is just against my adversary. That's her request. It's very simple. It's short. But she does it every day. Her rejection. 
for some time, every day, he refused. He doesn't care about God. He doesn't care about her. He's just, how fast can I crank through these cases? Sooner I get this line down, I go have lunch. I sure hope it doesn't go past noon. You see what I'm saying? He doesn't care about anyone, anything but himself. So he is refusing. He's refusing. She's rejected. I don't know about you, but I think the greatest pain that you can endure is that of rejection. That of rejection. From years of ministering to singles and singles ministry, and especially ministering in divorce recovery, I've seen the hardest broken hearts because they were rejected. It's painful. It's painful. Every day she goes. The prospect is not looking good. She's going to get rejected again. She stands waiting for her turn. But here's her exception. I like that word, but. (laughs) Finally, the judge says, Even though I don't fear God, I'm not like those people at Bethany, you know, trying to build that Jesus-built life. And even though I don't even care about people, this is his confession. He's admitting it. Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, because of her constant persistence, he says to me, I will see that she gets justice. She gets what she wants so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. Whoa. She is just driving me nuts. The only way I can solve this thing is to... You know, my kids used to do this, all right? I'd be at church, and the sermon was over. I'm at the door greeting, and and people come by greeting. My my, my son would come, and he'd grab my pants and go like that, you know, try to get my attention. And I'm talking, you know, I'm talking adults, you know, and, and... and pretty soon, hey, dad, dad. I said, well, one, one minute. And he's pulling, dad, dad. Finally, I leave the adults alone, right? And I said, what do you want? <laughs> and then he would tell me, right? And that's exactly what she's doing here. This is the scenario. This is the situation. She's getting the attention that she wants to the case that she has. And we're not even told what the case was about. She just wanted justice. And the Lord said, he's done with the story here now, and he turns the story to make the application. Listen to what the unjust judge says. Listen to that. And now he's going to ask a question from what is called the lesser to the greater. The argument is if the lesser, an unjust judge, does this, he says, listen, and will not God, who is just, bring about justice for his chosen ones who, he cry, who cry out to him day and night. Here's the question. Will God do right by me? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. What do I believe? Will God ultimately do right by me? And the answer is yes, he will. And so the answer to the whole thing is don't give up. Don't give up. Then he throws a second question out there. He says, will he keep putting them off? Now there's a good question. Will God keep ignoring me? Will he keep ignoring me? We prayed earlier today, our Father which art in heaven, Hallowed or sacred be your name. Then we added this line, your kingdom come. I believe that is a reference to the coming of the Lord, setting up his kingdom on earth. And the book of Revelation tells me it's going to last for a thousand years. Every time we pray that, we're saying, God, come and set up the kingdom where your will is done on earth. You realize one day God is going to answer that prayer and it's going to be majestic. Jesus is returning, and he's going to reign for a thousand years. It's going to be a glorious time. We pray that every time we pray the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come. Because when your kingdom comes, your will be done. 
And I'm saying, God, I want your will to intrude in time and space right now and be done in my life as it will be in the kingdom to be done now. Will he keep ignoring me? No. Sooner or later he's going to answer, and that's exactly what he said. And the Lord said, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Now we translate that almost often like, and I say quickly, but as in the sense of immediately. How come? I prayed today and it didn't happen tomorrow. But there's a sense in which the word quickly doesn't mean immediately because she's been praying persistently over a period of time. So it wasn't quickly. It went on and on. It was dragged out. She's pulling her hair out over the judge. The other sense is that it happens suddenly. Boom, the answer comes. You've been praying and praying and praying. I don't know, maybe you're praying and praying and praying for a, a son or a daughter. And you're saying, man, this thing, I just keep praying and praying and nothing's happening, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. And then, boom, suddenly, the answer comes to your prayer. <laughs> suddenly. Suddenly. That's the way I think the passage is telling us. Final question, though. Jesus says, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is such a powerful question. Because at this point, he's not talking about the second coming. He's talking about the first coming. When the Son of Man, that's Jesus, when he comes, and he's asking them the question, and they don't even realize he's there. Whoa, he's there. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? And what he's actually saying at this moment, do you believe? Do you believe in prayer? Enough to be persistent. To see your prayer to its end, do you believe in prayer? I have it up there. It's will you believe. It's really do you believe. Do you believe. Do you believe. So what's the whole point? The whole point here is don't give up on your prayer request. I don't know what your prayer request is. Don't give up on it. The second part is have faith until the answer comes or until Jesus comes. (laughs) Have faith. Just trust, 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 trust because it'll happen suddenly, and then one day you'll be looking back on it. Boy, remember how God did that? Just suddenly crashed in. Just suddenly crashed in. At the nick of time, just suddenly crashed in and answered by prayer. The second story, and they're both tied. He told two stories to these people uh, because they're both about prayer. And the second story said to, to some who were confident in their own righteousness, they're confident about their righteousness, they're proud, they're, and they look down upon everybody else. I think he's referring to the Pharisees here. They were the spiritual elite of the day. And there are two contrasting characters here in the second story. Two men went up to the temple to pray. The one is a Pharisee. He's the spiritual elite. He's the guy looking down his nose on everybody. And the other person was a tax collector. Now, if you were to list sinners according to the degree of their being hated by the Jews, the tax collector was on the very bottom. He was the worst of the worst, the lowest of low. That was the guy. And so Jesus is taking what they felt was the top end, the Pharisee, spiritual elite, and the worst kind of sinner. I'm going to be able to deal with the spiritual elite first because that's what Jesus did. He says, and the Pharisee stood up. He had this posture of prayer. And and he had his uh, air about him that, uh, listen to me, I am the prayer. And he gets up and he prays. And it's a proud prayer because he prayed about himself. Do you realize that Jesus taught us to pray, our Father? (laughs) It's not about me, it's about God. But here he stands up and he prays about himself, and he says, God, you're my audience, I thank you that I'm not like other men. You made me very special. (laughs) God, you are so blessed that I came to you. I wonder what the world would do without me. You know, I think your church would collapse if it weren't for me. I mean, uh, Oh, Lord, hey, you got the prize when you got me. (laughs) He is so proud and arrogant. He's spiritually the elite. So much so that he's condescending. 
He says, I'm not like the other men, robbers and evildoers, adulterers. And remember what I said about tax collector? And then the scum of the earth, <laughs> this tax collector. Boy, am I somebody. He is so proud and arrogant, and he's condescending, putting down the others. And then he is so boastful. Look what I've done. I fast twice a week. You know, the fact that he is saying this out loud is negating it. It's negating it because he's got his reward already. He's got the praise of men and the envy of men to saying, wow, you've done a wonderful thing. I don't know if you've ever fasted. Longest fast I did was a 10-day fast. Never fasted longer than that. You get to a point where you're not even hungry anymore. I'd go out to dinner with friends and not even eat. I mean, you get to a point where you're just not hungry anymore. And so this guy's fasting two times a week, you know, one, two days of the week. And we're not even sure he's fasting all day long. I mean, we fast every day in a certain sense. Uh, you eat your breakfast in the morning to break your fast because while you're sleeping, you didn't eat. Okay, I had a fast. But this guy is so proud and arrogant about, I fast twice a week. Oh, here, and I give a tenth of all I get. This is his badge and status symbol that, uh, God, I, I, I give you a tenth. What, would, what in the world would you, I think your whole kingdom would collapse without my 10%. Are you kidding me? Like, God needs my 10%. He doesn't need, he, he owns everything. So when I give my 10%, it's not because of out of obligation or pride or a badge. I give it simply because I love God. And if I'm proud and arrogant about what I give, I've just negated that too. I've negated that too. This man, if I can say this, this man is praying how you should not pray. This is how you should not pray. On the other hand, the tax collector, we had a, the woman who wouldn't give up, now we got the tax collector who couldn't look up. He's humiliated. He's the outcast. He's the scum. The tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even come close. Can you imagine? He's, he's the guy that comes into the temple and he slips in the back doors and he doesn't even want to sit down in a pew because he is the outcast. Everybody at church is so much holier. They're so more, much more pious. They read their Bibles. They know their verses. He knows none of that. He's been a swindler. He knows he's been evil. He's outcast from the rest. He doesn't fit in. And he is so humiliated. He would not even look up to heaven. He is totally ashamed of what he has done. He's ashamed. His gesture is he beats his breast. That, that was a gesture of sorrow, remorse, and regret. He regrets what he has done. And then he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. This is his plea. This is plea. This is a powerful plea. It's very short. Very, very short. God, have mercy. It's that word mercy that intrigues me. The word mercy has been translated uh, other places as propitiation. Now, there's a word you don't use every day. <laughs> propitiation is the same word that was used for the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a box about the size of the Lord's Supper table. That had the two angels on it. And, and the lid of the box, because you could open it, the lid, the surface, was called the propitiation place. The mercy seat. It's translated in New Testament, propitiation. Once a year, according to Leviticus 16, the high priest would come in and he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat, propitiation. And he would make what is called atonement. Sprinkling the blood, atonement made a covering. They would cover the sins. Now, inside the box was the Ten Commandments. 
And so the Ten Commandments, when we sin, all that it is is I'm breaking God's law. I'm not doing it God's way. I'm, I'm offending God. So the blood would, would be sprinkled on there, and it would cover over the broken law, and propitiation was made. It was called atonement, a covering. Until the New Testament, Jesus it says the blood of bulls and goats could never take away the sin, but Jesus, the Lamb of God, took away the sin of the world. So that in 1 John 2, 2, it says Jesus is our propitiation. He is our atoning sacrifice. When Jesus died on the cross, he took away our sins. What I'm saying is loaded in this little verse, God, he says, have the blood cover my sins. He's pleading the blood on me, the worst of all sinners. Here's the point. Jesus said, I tell you that this man, this humble, repentant sinner pleading the blood, rather than the other, went home justified. The point is, who's justified? The humble, repentant sinner is humble before God, not the arrogant and proud, look what I've done for Jesus. It's the humble. So that there's a principle that Jesus elaborates on, and he says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. God will make you low. You're proud and arrogant, I will cut you down. And he who humbles himself before God, makes himself very small, pleads the blood. He himself will be exalted and made very high. Whew. Powerful teaching from our Savior. Humility is exalted. Pride is abased. That's the principle. That's the principle. The thing is, we need to live this out. This is a great story that Jesus gave us, but we need to live these things out. I need to humble myself. You need to humble yourself like the guy who couldn't look up and realize I'm coming into the presence of a holy God. And it's only by the blood of Christ that I have such access. And I come to him humbly, but I come to him boldly. And I need to be persistent and never give up in my prayers like the gal who wouldn't give up. We have to live it out. This needs to be our lives too. We need to live it out today. And by today, living it out, uh, tonight's our prayer, our, our, our concert of prayer. And, and we've made uh, cards like this, and they're in the bulletin. Let us join you in your request. Just write it down. Maybe you've already filled it out and dropped it in the offering plate, but there will be a, an offering plate by the door. You just fill this card out and you drop it in, we're going to pray for every single request that comes in today. We're going to do it at the concert of prayer tonight. You need to let us share. You need to share it so we, we can pray with you. We can live it out also by coming tonight and humbly joining us to pray at the concert of prayer. At 6 o'clock, you come. We're going to pray. We're going to pray through all the requests. You don't even have to be the prayer warrior. You can just come and sit and take it all in as the people of God pray for every request that comes in. We're going to do all kinds of prayers, different kinds of prayers. But it'll be a time, an hour, a little more, maybe a little less, depending how long we pray, of taking our request to the Lord. It's another way. We have the prayer outreach sheets out by the door. We've been trying to pray for our neighborhoods. You just write down the addresses of the places you're praying. You fill that out. You turn it back into us. And next week is the cutoff point. You've got to turn it into us. Because we're going to then, those homes that you've prayed for, that they might find Jesus, they might find Bethany, or it doesn't matter if they find Jesus. We're going to send a postcard to every single one of them, inviting them to come for Good Friday and Easter. And you'll have prayed for them. When they, when they come, they're the answer to your prayer request. That postcard may sit in a kitchen drawer. You know, the junk drawer, every kitchen's got one. <laughs> For two or three years, they pull that out at a moment of crisis. You say, ah, not yeah, it happened. I was pastoring Whitehall Baptist Church in Philadelphia. We did a, a mailing like that. Three years later, a gal came in with the card. 
It happened suddenly, not immediately. We want you to pray, fill this out, bring it in, and we will then address, label them, ship them out. No one's signing them this time around. We're running out of time to do that, so we're just going to, just a, a mailing out. You can be a part of it. You can live this out being that prayer warrior. We're going to do it right now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we humble ourselves before you. We know we're nothing special, and Lord, we'd be a fool to think like that Pharisee. What would you do without me? I'm surprised, Lord, you've included me. We all have things on our hearts today. I'm asking, Lord, they jot, jot, just jot the card so that we can join each one in that prayer request. We'll have them all printed out. We can take it home with us the, after the service tonight and make that our prayer list that we pray and pray and pray with persistence. And Father, right now there's someone, you're revealing it to them in their heart and their mind what they need to put on that card. I pray, Lord, that you would open opportunity for them to return tonight and join us in praying. It'll be the start of our persistent prayer until we get our answer from heaven. Bless us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.